Coming up, if you're here to talk about the D-back series split against the Washington Nationals, you've come to the right place. We're breaking it all down for you next. You are Locked On Diamondbacks, your daily Arizona Diamondbacks podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome into the Locked On Diamondbacks podcast. You're part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day listening to who? The always charismatic host of this podcast, Miller Thomas. I'm a multimedia journalist and I'm a graphic designer. So please go check out my website, millerthomas 24myportfoliocom On there, you can see all my latest work from my packages to my articles to my photos and my graphic design. If you want to see more content by me, just follow me on Twitter at creatorthomas24 for my personal account, or just look up Locked On Diamondbacks on both Twitter and Instagram for the podcast handle. And of course, thank you for making Locked On Diamondbacks your first listen every day. I would not be able to do this podcast without you, my loyal listeners, sharing, subscribing, reviewing, doing all that so I could do this podcast for you. Thank you. It's free and available on all platforms, so please continue to tell your friends. As I mentioned on the open, we're going to be breaking down the last two D-backs games, the last two D-backs wins in this series split against the Washington Nationals, and then we're going to preview game one against the New York Mets. So we just played last weekend. They're now coming to Arizona and hopefully the D-backs can keep their momentum going. So if they want to do that, they got to continue what they were doing against the Washington Nationals, which is offense. Their offense is finally, finally showing signs of life. We've been waiting for the offensive breakout game all season, and it came yesterday against the Washington Nationals as the the D-backs took down the Nats 11-2. to Yes, we got double-digit runs. We got double-digit hits. And then you look at today's game. Yes, the D-backs only scored four runs, but they did hit three bombs in today's game. The first game this season with more than two home runs in a single game. So the D-backs definitely showed some signs of life. And if you look at that Seth Beer double in the fourth inning yesterday in that 11-run explosion, the D-backs, until that double by Seth Beer, with runners in scoring position in two outs. They were 0 for 34 until that double by Beer. They were just 10 for 75 on the season with runners in scoring position. So Seth Beer's double yesterday was the first time the D-backs had an RBI, or at least came through with an RBI opportunity with two outs. So good job by Seth Beer and the D-backs offense, who as a whole yesterday in that 11-run outburst was really good. 5 for 10 with runners in scoring position, 10 hits, and they had 4 walks to 4 strikeouts. So you love to see that 1 to 1 ratio. Seth Beer continues to rake. I mean, this dude has been phenomenal for the D-backs this season. I mean, I I was I'm not surprised that he's been this good offensively because we talked a lot before the season. I said he was going to be my breakout player of the year for the D-backs. I said that my preseason predictions for the for this team. Go check the last podcast I did before the regular season started. I said Seth Beer was going to be the breakout player for the D-backs and so far that's coming into fruition. He's now batting 400 on the season with over 1000 OPS, I believe. So Seth Beer's absolutely killing it. And for the first time today, I believe for the first time, he made a start against a lefty pitcher and guess what? He didn't get a hit, but he didn't look over match at the plate he didn't look like a complete buffoon so hopefully uh Hopefully, Tori Lavello continues to keep using Seth Beer in the lineup even when there's the lefty on the mound because I really liked having Seth Beer and Christian Walker next to each other in the lineup. I like seeing Christian Walker in that full in that four hole, then Beer up in that five hole. You just get two guys, two first baseman prototypes, both with big power bats, both that can crush a ball. I just like seeing those two back to back, and it got me wondering. My dream lineup, if the D-backs were healthy, if we had a full complement of pieces, what would my dream lineup be? And you guys can let me know what you think about this on Twitter. Remember, at CreatorTimes24 for my personal account or Locked on Diamondbacks on both Twitter and Instagram. What do you think about this as a dream lineup? Little Dalton Varsho leading off. Rojas second. Little Ketan Marte third. 
Christian Walker fourth, Seth Beer fifth, David Peralta sixth, Carson Kelly seventh. Then you could do Luplo or Paven Smith or Cooper Hummel, depending on who's on the mound eighth, and then Perdomo or Nick Ahmed ninth. That sounds like a pretty damn good, I mean, by D-back standards, top nine. I mean, if Peralta is your sixth and Carson Kelly's your seventh, like, yeah, you might not have superstars in that lineup outside of Keto Marte, but there's not going to be a ton of scrubs either. I think that lineup should be able to score runs. I mean, this was a team that was averaging about two runs a game before these last two games. So I I think this D-backs offense has more in store. I mean, they have to be. I mean, considering how many players are performing way under their standards, there's not a lot of places this D-backs offense can go, but up and one guy that hope can continue to get better as the season rolls along because last year he was a big second half breakout star. That is Dalton Varsho, who I think his numbers will eventually catch up to him because I don't think Dalton Varsho has been bad this year. The traditional numbers tell you, ah, Varsho hasn't been that good. But if you look at some of the advanced numbers with Dalton Varsho, I mean, he went uh, he went yard twice during this series against the Nationals. His power is starting to pick up. We're still waiting for his first multi-hit game of the season, but he's at least in the 84th percentile in these stats. Hard hit percentage, barrel percentage, expected batting average, and expected slugging percentage. So he's barreling up the ball. He's getting hard contact. And the numbers tell you, the numbers expect he should be better than what he's doing right now. So I wouldn't be too worried about Darth about Dalton Varsho because I think we've seen the talent with him, what we saw last year, and even what we've seen this year, even though the batting average and the OPS numbers are low, he's already got three home runs. He's got some extra base hits. I think Dalton Varsho is going to be just fine. And a little bit more on today's game against the Nationals that the D-backs won 4-3. Three home runs today. First game all season with more than two home runs in a single game. Matt Davidson goes yard for his first at it. Goes yard in his first at bat of the season. It's been 3,133 days since his last home run in a D backs uniform. Cooper Hummel hit his second bomb of the year, and Jake McCarthy hit his first. And I like Jake McCarthy. He hasn't been great this year, but I just love his body type, his athleticism. He seems like he should be, he seems like he could be a, a guy that hits 25 home runs just from looking at him and his. And his body prototype, I keep saying the word prototype, but just looking at his body, I guess that's all I want to talk about is Jake McCarthy's body. When I look at his muscles and his arms and his stature, he looks like a dude that should be jack and home run. So Jake McCarthy is someone that I'm going to be keeping my eye on because the D-backs designated Stuart Fairchild. So it is now Jake McCarthy's job as a backup until we know we see what Jordan Loop, what happens with Jordan Loop low because Cooper Hummel or Jake McCarthy might get sent back down once, uh, Loop low is healthy, but right now I'm keeping my eyes on Jake McCarthy because I like the way he's looked so far this season. Yanni Hernandez, I want to give a shout out to him because he has steals in back to back games, which is huge because the D backs were one of the uh were one of the lowest uh teams in terms of uh, attempted steals in baseball last year. I don't know why I couldn't formulate that thought in my head. The D-backs did not steal a lot of bases last season, so Yanni Hernandez with a little Dalton Varsho action. And Keltel Marte might steal a few himself. Even a Perdomo is pretty quick as well. So the D-backs finally have athleticism on their team outside of a Tim LeCastro of years past to steal some bases for this D-backs team. But I still think a big reason why we haven't seen a more consistent offense out the D-backs. It's just because the lineup and batting order hasn't been consistent. Like someone like Seth Beer is in and out the lineup almost every day. Someone like Taven Smith is in and out the lineup a lot too. The D-backs and Toy Lavello just really value those cross matchups. So I think it's a big reason why we haven't seen as much consistency in the offense as we might want or, you know, that as much consistency in the offense that the D-backs might need because the offense has been terrible. I think it's been the worst part of this team so far, but I think a lot of these numbers will start to get better over the course of the season and hopefully sooner rather than later. I think Payman Smith has been having some good at bats at the plate. I think Dalton Varsho's numbers are going to catch up to him. Like we talked about someone like Christian Walker, the hard contact numbers have absolutely loved him this season as well. So I think some of these players will start to bounce back. Ketel Marte is an established superstar. Not too worried about him. Carson Kelly has been a little bit more worrisome than other than some of these other guys, but he at least has a track record of being good. So Overall, uh, I think this D-backs offense still 
is so untapped in terms of their potential. I'm not saying this is a top five offense if everything breaks right, but should this be a top 12, 13-ish offense in Major League Baseball? Yeah, probably. I don't think it's as bad as what we've seen. I think when everyone's fully healthy and maybe there's less, you know, switching in the lineup, like once Tori Lavello realizes I shouldn't keep sitting Seth Beer, he should be in the lineup every day. I think it will help stabilize the rest of the lineup when we stop making decisions like that. So I think this D-backs offense is starting to come around just a little bit. I wouldn't keep expecting 11 run games. I wouldn't keep expecting three home run games, but should we expect more games where the D-back score between four and five runs, probably more consistently. I think that's fair to expect that. Now, let's talk about how the pitching has been during the two D-backs wins at the end of this D-backs versus National Series. But first, I want to talk to you guys about Blue Nile and some fine jewelry because whether she prefers a statement piece or everyday subtle elegance, BlueNile.com has fine jewelry options for every mom. Shop high-quality classic diamond earrings, elegant tennis bracelets, or gemstone pennant necklaces. Looking for fine jewelry but having trouble choosing? Blue Nile has jewelry experts on hand 24-7, available via phone or chat to help you find a memorable gift at every budget. Mark Mother's Day with something enduring classic diamond stud earrings, elegant tennis bracelets, birthstone pennants, and so much more on BlueNile.com. This Mother's Day, give mom something she'll treasure forever with fine jewelry from BlueNile.com. And Locked On Dimebacks listeners get $50 off $500. This podcast exclusive is only good through Mother's Day. Use code LOCKEDON. That's code LOCKEDON. Plus, Every order is insured, ships free, and arrives in discreet packaging that won't give away what's inside. Shop stress-free and find your forever peace. Go go to BlueNile.com today. And this is the time of year that I've pretty much given up on all my New Year's resolutions, but not this year. I'm sticking to my resolution to eat right thanks to Built Bar. And have you tried the puffs? If you haven't, you're missing out on one of Built Bar's best-tasting bars. They're protein-infused with marshmallow, fluffy, and they're just absolutely delicious. And the reason why I love them is because they're covered in 100% chocolate, soft and easy to chew, and it tricks your brain. You think that you're eating a dessert or something that's akin to a candy bar, but no, you're actually eating a protein bar that's low in calorie, low in sugar, high in protein, and high in fiber, so it's great for that keto diet. Just go to built.com if you want your own order. Use promo code LOCK15, and you'll get 15% off your next order. Promo code LOCK15 for 15% off at Built.com. All right, all right, all right. Let's get back into the pod and let's discuss the pitching from these last two D-backs wins because I think the pitching has probably been the most impressive part of these two D-backs wins because Merrill Kelly, I'm staking my claim right now. I've said all preseason about how this guy was going to have a bounce back year. I said how we were going to get the 2020 Merrill Kelly back. I said he, he I said he was going to pitch around a 3-5 ERA. I think I might have been wrong about all three of those because the Merrill Kelly we're seeing right now, he's better than the 2020 Merrill Kelly. He's pitching better than the 3-5 ERA. Guess what? The 2022 Merrill Kelly, if you want to compare him to the 2020 Merrill Kelly, at least through the first three starts, well, The first three starts in 2020 for Merrill Kelly, 19.2 innings pitch, five earned runs, 15 strikeouts, dominant, phenomenal. You love what you saw in that 2020 Merrill Kelly through three starts. But in 2022, 15.1 innings pitch, so a little bit less volume, but one earned run and 18 strikeouts, more strikeouts and less innings pitch. This season's Merrill Kelly has been dominant. He had the longest streak of Any major league starter to start the year of allowing zero earned runs. He didn't allow an earned run until that sixth inning yesterday. Merrill Kelly is phenomenal right now. He has the lowest ERA in the National League at 0.59 for Merrill Kelly. What he's doing right now is absolutely silly for a guy who is in his early 30s fourth year in Major League Baseball, signed from the Korean League a few years ago. This is someone that is completely under the radar. This is someone that doesn't have the, uh, you know, the national attention or the respect of a lot of people. But you look at ERA Plus, Merrill Kelly is currently leading the National League in that. This dude is insane against the Nationals yesterday. 
six innings pitch, one earned run, one strikeout, or one earned run, one walk, five strikeouts against the Nationals. And he did that with some concerning numbers because his fastball velocity was actually down in that start yesterday, only averaging around 91.5 miles per hour. This is someone that averaged around 93 miles per hour in that first start, and his fastball velo has actually been going down in his previous two starts. Every start he has, the fastball velo has been going down. So you don't like to see that from Merrill Kelly. That is concerning, but even though the, even though the fastball velo is going down, his stuff seems to be getting better. Merrill Kelly seems to be getting more locked in at the plate. He really didn't run into too much trouble in yesterday's game. And when he did run into trouble, guess what? He had someone like Yanni Hernandez bailing him out and throwing out Josh Bell at home. So really there was like one or two innings with Merrill Kelly where he got into some trouble. Outside that, he was moving pretty quickly throughout the game. I believe he had 80 pitches thrown through six innings. So Merrill Kelly could have made the argument that maybe he should have gone out there for the seventh inning. I think most of the time, Merrill Kelly would go out there for the seventh inning, but we're still in that quote-unquote extended spring training. So I think that's a big reason why he didn't go out there for the seventh. But even though that fastball velo is starting to go down with every start and it's concerning, if you look at yesterday's start, he did abandon the sinker because there's not much of a difference between that fastball and sinker in terms of velocity. He abandoned that sinker ball yesterday, and instead he went more with the changeup as his secondary pitch to off-speed the velocities, and the changeup was nasty for Merrill Kelly yesterday. So I love what Merrill Kelly's doing. I think he's firmly going to be in the Cy Young Award race for the rest of 2022. But let's talk about Zach Davies a little bit because he pitched today, and I think we were all surprised to see Zach Davies actually had a good start, his best start of the season. Five innings pitch, two walks, seven strikeouts, and two earned runs. I think those seven strikeouts was the the thing that stood out the most from his stat line. Six of his seven strikeouts came on his changeup, so he was absolutely working that. Oh, I don't think I said a real sentence. So he was absolutely working guys with that changeup. The fourth inning was pretty much the only time he struggled during the game. And Davies is someone who has had a track record of success in Major League Baseball. Even though he wasn't good last year with the Chicago Cubs, if you look at his ERA, it was like a 5.7. It's like a 5.7 right now. He hasn't been great to start the year this year, and he wasn't great last year. But if you look at his stats from 2019 to 2020, a two-year sample size, despite 2020 being a shortened season, it's like 43 starts he made during those two years. And he had a 3.3 ERA during those two during those two years. That's a pretty decent sample size. So it's not like Zach Davies has always been a bad pitcher. So if he came around and started to heat up a little bit in the back end of the rotation for the D-backs, don't be a surprise if Zach Davies gets on like a three, four, five star streak of pitching around a three, four, three, five year reign. Us thinking, wow, Zach Davies might be a solid back end starter and might not be as bad as we once thought. So keep an eye out on Zach Davies. So hopefully keeping the momentum going with his starts. Ian Kennedy, he came in today. He struggled a little bit, gave up a couple walks. Also wasn't helped out by the defense era and a catcher's interference by the D-backs defense. And then Mark Melanson just had to make a sweat out the ninth inning because he got into a bases loaded jam in the ninth inning. Thankfully, he was able to get out of it. But I thought he was going to go back to those two out struggles once again like he did earlier in the season. But thankfully, Melanson was able to get out of it. Overall, the starters continue to pitch well under Brent Strom. If you take out Caleb Smith, his one start this season, um, I think the D-backs have like a 1.7 ERA from their starters. Like literally, go take out Caleb Smith's ear, uh, go take out Caleb Smith's start and do the math yourself. It's like a 1.7 ERA by the D-back starters. It has arguably been the best rotation in baseball so far. That is completely the Brent Strom effect. I told uh I forgot who we were talking about. I think we were I think I told this to Brent Wheelhouse of Lockdown Astros. I told him if the D-backs rotation has a pretty good season and it's one of the better rotations in baseball. Brent Strom should win the Cy Young Award. And I already gave it to Merrill Kelly, but I think Brent Strom might have a case as well. He might have to be in the running. We might have to give the we might have to do a co-award with the Cy Young Award. Maybe give it to both Merrill Kelly and Brent Strom. They both could take it home if Merrill Kelly wins it. You could also put Brent Strom's name on the plaque because I think he'll probably be deserving. And, you know, it would be the respectful thing to do since Brent Strom is turning all these D-backs pitchers into Cy Young Award winners. So 
Let's hope Brett Shaw can also do that for Zach Gallen, who will be pitching tomorrow against the New York Mets, which is a game we'll preview on the Lockdown Dimebacks podcast. But first, I want to talk to you guys about Bet Online because if you want to place a bet on Merrill Kelly winning the 2022 Cy Young Award, you need to go to betonline.net because it is your number one source for all your betting stats and sports info. Find all the latest sports developments, league reviews, and news, including this year's basketball playoffs in the start of the Major League Baseball season. BetOnline is your continued source for all your sports and wagering information from live betting to playoffs, esports, and more. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and actions. BetOnline, where the game starts. All right, all right, all right. Let's get back into the pod and let's discuss Game one against the New York Mets, because as I mentioned, the Mets are playing the D-backs once again. We played each other last week. The Mets won that series. The D-backs had a chance to win that series the last game, but they were not able to come through in that last game. I'm trying to think, was that the game where the D-backs had like the bases loaded and nobody out? I can't even remember because there's so many squandered opportunities in pretty much every D-backs game that they all get jumbled together. But I know they definitely were the reasons that they lost against the New York Mets and not the other way around. Hopefully they can get their revenge this weekend. I'm hoping to go to Sunday's game because I got my tickets opening weekend. So that means they give us a second pair of tickets for free. So I'm hoping to use it on Sunday's game uh, against the New York Mets. So I could give me that free hooded tee. But before we talk about game one, um, Corbin Martin was sent down to the minor leagues. I just want to address this because it ticked me off. It made me a little upset when I saw this because it's like, why is Corbin Martin being sent down? Is this a service time thing? Is this, you know, trying to preserve his options or whatever that, you know, Major League Baseball likes to do with their young players and the idea of let's put them in the minors and not put them in the majors to see what we have because they sent down Corbin Martin, who I think has been pretty good so far this season. He was a little bit worse in his second outing for the D-backs, gave up a couple hard hits, gave up an earned run, but also has been a strikeout artist whenever he's coming to the game. So he's someone that I would definitely like to see be given more of an opportunity, but instead the D-backs are keeping guys like Matt Davidson on the roster, you know, picking him up off the waivers or keeping a guy like Oliver Perez on the roster who's 40 years old. Like, it just makes no sense. Like, I'm good on the mediocre infielders like the Yanni Hernandez's and the Alcantara's. Like, they've been fine for the D-backs, but if it's between those guys or making sure I have a Corbin Martin on the roster, like, I'm taking a Corbin Martin every time because I'd rather see what we have in these young pitchers than these random middle infielders or corner infielders that end up turning into just nothing players and just end up wasting spots. It's harder to find a gem of a position player than a gem. You know, when I talk about gem, I'm talking about diamond in the rough. It's harder to find a diamond in the rough position player off the waiver wire than to find a diamond in the rough, you know, reliever or bullpen guy or back end starter. So the D backs want to find these diamond in the roughs or at least evaluate their own talent or at least evaluate their own talent like a Corbin Martin, who they acquired in the Zach Ranky trade. Well, you got to actually play these guys and not play guys like Alvar Perez over them. So D-backs, please get that one right. Because when I see someone like Corbin Martin, who's young and has been good for the team this season, when I see him getting sent to the minors and I got to keep watching Alvar Perez come out the bullpen, it makes me very upset. So please, please make that one right. But we got Zach Gallon on the mound versus David Peterson tomorrow. Gallon. This will be his second start against the Mets. He made one start so far this season. That was his debut last Saturday against the New York Mets, and he went four innings pitch, two hits, zero earned runs, and two strikeouts on 66 pitches. I thought he looked pretty good for his first start of the year, considering he was dealing with shoulder issues in spring training and was dealing with a cut on his thumb. I was like, wow, this is a pretty good Zach Allen start, and I'm not surprised. And uh, I'm not surprised that he was good. I think I was a little bit surprised by how, Well, his velo was in that first game because I wouldn't have been surprised if he had to build up that arm strength before that fastball velocity started to tick up. But no, his fastball sat at 93.4 miles per hour in his starting debut, which is the same that is sat last year. It sat last year, 93.4 miles per hour as well. And considering his fastball has gone up every year since 2019, the fact that it's already sitting at 93.4 miles per hour actually makes me believe that maybe this guy could hit 94, 95 miles per hour by the end of the season if things continue the way, it, you know, if things continue the way they are. His spin rate, 
I'm struggling to talk. His spin rate was also higher on his fastball than last year as well, which I think is kind of interesting. He didn't use his slider on Saturday, which could just be because it was his first start and he didn't want to use every pitch in his arsenal. But it is a pitch that he threw around the same amount of times as his curveball the last couple of years. And the fact that the fact that he didn't use it at all in his starting debut, it was just something I want to keep my eye on for tomorrow. It might just be something he saves in his back pocket or it might be something that he just felt like he wasn't ready for. Or maybe it was because of the cut of his thumb. Maybe the slider was the most affected by that cut. So maybe that was the reason he didn't use it last Saturday. I don't know why Gallon didn't use the slider. Maybe it's the cut. Maybe it's the lineup he was facing. But I'm curious to see if Gallon debuts that slider tomorrow. I'm also hoping to see if he gets a longer leash, a second start. Maybe they let him go into the fifth inning. Maybe they let him throw around 75, 80 pitches. Something I definitely want to watch with Zach Gallon. And then for the D-backs offense, got lefty David Peterson on the bump. The D-backs offense last time against Peterson did absolutely nothing. 4.1 innings pitched. Zero earned runs, two walks, three strikeouts. He's a guy with the mid-90s fastball and sinker with a slider and changeup. So he's definitely going to be trying to induce a lot of ground balls, which the D-backs are very prone to. They were not able to get a lot of action on the bases last time against Peterson. They really need to because whenever Peterson has runners in scoring position, that's when he typically tends to struggle in his career. Peterson, 270 average and 760 760 OPS allowed with runners in scoring position. So if the D-backs can get some action going, that's when they could really take advantage of Peterson. I am curious to see if Seth Beer will start for the second game in a row against the lefty. That will be mind-blowing. If Tori Lovello did that, it will break analytics in the computer department in the D-backs front office. So I would love to see Seth Beer start for a second game against the lefty. Guys, if you want him to get better against lefties, you have to play him against lefties. So hopefully Seth Beer starts. And if the D-backs get their win tomorrow, they get a win tomorrow against the New York Mets. It will be their first three-game winning streak of the season. So it will be nice to see. It will be nice to see some momentum um, sustained by this D-backs team and especially that offense because the pitching has been so good. I'm not worried about Zach Allen on the mound tomorrow. I just hope the offense can keep it going, and I hope the offense is not the reason the D-backs lose tomorrow's ball game. Now that's it for this edition of the Lock on Dimebacks podcast. Go back and catch up on any pods you might have missed this week. We got one more podcast coming for you guys tomorrow, Friday, of course. So come back for more Dimebacks news coverage and insight. Thank you for making Locked on Dimebacks your first listen every day. Go make your second listen of the day, Locked on MLB with my pal Sully Baseball. And as always, stay safe. And stay healthy. Deuces.